All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York, the 7th of January, 2004, um, 1 p.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. What is your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Connor George Fries Peterson, uh, 26th of February, 1922, Chicago, Illinois, but raised in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering the service? High school graduate Alexander Hamilton in Brooklyn. Okay, now you joined in January 1938? Yeah. Did you enlist? Or? Enlisted in National Guard. Okay. Um, why did you decide to do that? I wanted to be in, in the Army, but uh, I was young when I graduated high school. My father had a, a restaurant, so I got involved in that. But. Uh, he was a veteran of World War One, and he belonged to Legion, the 106th Infantry Armory. So that's how I ended up there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, now, uh, where did you go for basic training? At that time, you, did you, you didn't not, go away. You took you basic just training took it with the, the unit. Okay. Uh, was it in an armory? In the armory, Bedford Atlantic in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and then uh, Camp Smith. Okay. And, uh, um, what kind of uh, equipment and weapons did you use? Mostly World War One, uh, Springfield, the, the BAR, O3. the O3, mm -hmm. BAR, 60 millimeter mortar. Uh, the typical infantry company at that time. Mm -hmm. What kind of uh, helmet and did you get the leggings? We had, we had the flat. Uh, well, when I came in, we had the flat World War One. Mm -hmm. Did and you wear leggings too? The wrap leggings. The wrap leggings. Uh huh. Then. Uh, we didn't get the uh, leather ones until we were inducted in uh, 41. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what was some of the training like when you went up to Camp Smith? What did you do there? Infantry training, Just marksmanship, primarily, well, with squ uh, squad level and uh, rifle marksmanship. And at that time, uh, that was the basic infantry training. You didn't go aboard above squad level. Mm -hmm. um, how long were you at Camp Smith each time? How many times did you go up there? Oh, I went to Camp Smith a number of times, two weeks. We went up one time, a week in the winter, and then we started going to Camp Drum. Mm -hmm. Did you have any uh, maneuvers and so on? Large First Army maneuvers, maneuvers at Fort Drum in 1940. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was in preparation. We knew then that the guard was going to be called starting in October. Actually, uh, because of uh, changes, I happen to be a very fortunate guardsman because I enlisted in the infantry, but because of reorganization, I ended up in M MP Battalion, 101st MP Battalion. Uh, I think it was the 10th in the Albany area, it became the 106th. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a good, a good fortunate thing to some extent. Um, we were the last outfit of the New York National Guard that went on active duty when they were called. They started going up on the 1st of October and we went the 10th of March of 41. Okay. Now where were you uh, when you heard about Pearl Harbor and how did you hear we were, uh, our home station was uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey, and the Third Corps had done three months uh, field exercises down in North Carolina, and we were on our way back. Now, what were those exercises like when you went, you went to North Carolina? Yeah, that, well, well, that was Corps. We, actually, we were escort for the 44th Division, which was stationed at Dix. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we were, the, the uh, exercises were over and we were on our way back. We were escort, escorting, uh, I think it was the 71st Infantry. And uh, we pulled through Richmond, Virginia, and people were out there cheering and yelling and whatever. We didn't know why. And uh, that night we pulled into Fredericksburg, Virginia. That's when the first we heard about 
war had started. Mm -hmm. What was the reaction of yourself and, and others around you? Well, wondering where we were going to be assigned next because as soon as we got the, back to Fort Dix, they were sending detachments out to all what they considered critical installations at that time. Mm -hmm. We were going out and guarding bridges, railroad, railroad uh, terminals, radio stations, anything that would, even today, would be considered uh, essential point. Mm -hmm. That's where we went. Mm -hmm. Now, were you given loaded weapons at oh, the yeah. time? You had loaded oh, yeah. weapons. We, we had loaded weapons. Well, we had loaded weapons all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, <laughs> the funny thing is that we were given leave. Two weeks later, we were all pulled back and we were given leave. Um, and then we were told two companies were pulled out. Now see that? They've got a notice on, on the thing over here that one company was pulled out at 101st and sent down to MacArthur. It was two companies. A and B companies were pulled out. We were in B. A uh, went down and to Melbourne where MacArthur first came in. We ended up in Brisbane. But uh, now this is the 101st MP. MP Battalion. And then, uh, oh, I guess it was, uh, we became the 14th MP Company. Then they changed us to the 814th MP Company. We ended up as the 814th Company for the rest of the war. Now, where were you assigned and what were some of your assignments? Well, we, we uh, sailed... In March, the first of March of uh, 42, we sailed out of the Brooklyn Army Base. Went down, there were five of uh, five uh, transports. Now, did you like, have a Navy escort? We had, I thought, the entire Navy escorted us down. We went through the canal. Mm -hmm. We come out of the canal. We went through there. At night and getting through at dawn the next day, the big five fat transports, and we're sitting out there, and we got a little Australian escort. That's all we had all across the Pacific. But uh, we stopped at Bora Bora. That's where we became familiar with the native people, the beautiful Polynesian women. Oh, this is going to be fine. And then we. Uh, Landed in Australia. I'm not sure where, whether we, that's where we were originally headed for. Because uh, the Philippines fell while we were seeing the Pacific. Mm -hmm. so. But then we landed at Brisbane. And we spent almost a year and a half in Brisbane. Sometimes we wondered about that. <clears throat> when I read the book, I think it was Manchester, wrote a book... Uh, American Caesar about the oh, MacArthur. About MacArthur. That's where I found out that when we got over there, one of the first things we I was a sergeant at the time. One of the first things we did, we went out in the countryside in Queensland, and we were digging foxholes and defense emplacements. Never knew why until I read that book. MacArthur set up the Brisbane line, and he was set to let the Japs come as far as Brisbane. That's mm -hmm. where he was going to stop them. Now, uh, so did after, you ever get to see MacArthur? Oh yeah, I saw MacArthur quite often because he moved, GHQ moved from Brisbane, uh, from Melbourne to Brisbane, and that's when we took over. And uh, oh, I used to have uh, a guard outside his suite in the hotel at all times. Wife was a wonderful woman. His what did you son think? was a brat. What did you think of him? I didn't like him. Had nothing to do with him coming up, what happened there, if he was there. He didn't get along with the Provo Marshal uh, of Brisbane that we worked for, and he relieved them and he sent them home. Actually, uh, the story went that uh, he said, hey, you can't uh, lock up any people from my headquarters 
and uh, the colonel said, what the heck was his name? Uh, we'll get to it. But he said to him, hey, if they, uh, they're a soldier, if they do anything to be nailed by the military police, they'll get nailed. So he got returned home. He was a major general. God, I can't think of his name. He was uh, Truman's. He, he fought with Truman in the First War. And when he got to Washington, he became Truman's aide. But, uh, and that was one of the reasons most of the men in my outfit. Now, you take the one from the 813th down in Brisbane, uh, Melbourne, where he first came in. I knew a couple of the guys who were his personal bodyguards mm -hmm. until he moved up. And they, they swore by him. Uh, other than that, didn't have much to do with MacArthur. But I think that led to eventually our company was relieved and we were sent to New Guinea. And uh, I always felt good because they took over the job we were doing as an MP company with an MP battalion. How long were you uh, in New uh, Guinea? Oh, about, about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then I came home. They had a rotation. They came in with a rotation system that, uh, oh, I forget what the exact figures were, but after you had so much time, you were eligible for rotation. So uh, I rotated home from Lake New Guinea, and the uh, company went to uh, the Philippines shortly after that. Now, what were your, some of your duties were basically the same on New Guinea? Yeah, I, I was a provost sergeant. Mm -hmm. I ran a stockade at both uh, military prisoners, civilian prisoners. When I say civilian prisoners, we had a number of uh, Malaysians who had mutinied on uh, Dutch ships. They were confined with us, and then we had... We were transient for uh, Japanese POWs, very few. And then I uh, went home on rotation. I was assigned here in the States. Now, when was that that you went home? 44. Mm -hmm. The end of 40. I spent Christmas home that year. You came home and you went to a rotation center and signed here within the States, except at that time uh, the Battle of the Bulge was going on. Everybody who came in was reclassified infantry. We went back and uh, I think they were setting us up for shipment to Europe. And then we were lucky. And I, when I say I was fortunate, then we won in the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. So that uh, stopped, and I ended up assigned in uh, Richmond, Virginia until the war ended. Now what did you do there? Uh, police work, um, rode the trains, we, we were escorts on the trains, we covered the trains from uh, Richmond to Washington or south to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, because I was a sergeant, I missed out on a couple of good assignments. At that time, toward the end of the war, the assignment um, down in, in Richmond, I liked the motorcycle. I learned to ride the motorcycle in the Army. And uh, they had sort of a state police setup. You were assigned, your quarters were at a private homes in some town and you had a hundred miles of road that you covered. But I couldn't get that way because I was a sergeant. That's one of the good things I missed out on. What kind of motorcycles did they have? Harley Harleys Davids. Or, Harleys. They didn't have Indians? Just, no, no just Indians. Harleys. Well, my unit didn't have Indians. They had Indians in the Army, uh -huh. but we had Harleys. I think they were called a 32 at the time. I know they have them in the museum down at Fort Knox. Yeah, I think they're 45 cubic inch uh, flatheads, uh, yeah. I don't know that much. But I enjoy that quite a bit. Uh, I didn't mention earlier, <clears throat> when the draft started, 
and we knew we were going to be inducted. I got a number of my friends from the neighborhood, including my brother, to enlist in the guard. So we went away together because I said, hey, why get drafted and get assigned with nobody? You know, this way we'll all go away together. We're only going away for a year. Mm -hmm. When we came back five years later, some of the girls in the neighborhood wouldn't talk to me. But, uh, <laughs> But that's so. You, your brother was with you for oh, the yeah. whole time. Well, see, until I uh, came home on uh, rotation, he went up to the Philippines, and he came home from the Philippines on rotation, and he got home just after uh, sometime the end of May, just after uh, Germany was defeated, and at that time they discharged him. <laughs> they had enough points. Uh, I don't know if you know the points, but yes. you get so many points for time and service, time overseas and all that. So they discharged them. And uh, here I was. <laughs> I was assigned down at Richmond. No, yeah. If anything, you're allowed to go to Japan. <laughs> but it came up because he was, a, what it was, because he was unassigned, they discharged them. And that's why I ended up in Richmond. And that's the, f went back to Dix and was discharged from Dix in uh, August of 45. Now, did you, uh, did they train you at all or get you ready to be in ready, ready for the Japan, the J invasion Not really. of Japan? And I think possibly that was because I was originally an infantryman. Mm -hmm. Talking about training though, now here. We were trained as infantrymen, converted to an MP battalion. We stationed at Fort Dix. All the non-coms, we went to the Jersey State Police School at Seagirt for three weeks to learn to be MPs. But other than that, uh, no, I didn't, I didn't get to go to any of the schools. <clears throat> Now, where were you, and uh, what was your reaction when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? I was in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, he came up from Georgia by train, and at every crossing from Georgia to uh, New York, or Washington, I forget, where, there was an MP, or, well, a soldier, mm -hmm. and I spent the night at a... a uh, crossing in Virginia, outside of Richmond, when he came up. Actually, as it worked out, and as uh, my personal opinion, I think Truman was a great guy. I think he, his being vice president, becoming a president was a great thing. I think that uh, it stops here. The book stops here. Applied to him, he made the decision. And when he decided that uh, he was going to run the atom bomb, I think he was thinking more about the American soldier than he was thinking about anybody else. What was your reaction to that? I think he was right. Mm -hmm. As I say, um, I had been back in the States, and they were now talking about uh, now going to Japan. We'll get more troops out that way. But here again, I was fortunate because everything fell in place for me to be in, in the right place at the right time to avoid anything. Uh, I think the most dangerous thing uh, I had during the war, well, too, when we rode through the Pacific, not knowing what was out there, big fight fat troop ships, and then once in a while when we were up in New Guinea and Moresby, we used to get what they call washing machine Charlie, a single jet bomb would come over and drop a bomb now and then. But other than that, I was fortunate. Did you catch any of the jungle diseases or oh, anything yeah. like that? Oh yeah, jungle rot. Uh -huh. I, I had that when I came home for quite a while. Uh, I guess for almost five years after the war, on my hands. But other than that, uh, then when I got discharged at Fort Dix, I wanted to go into the uh, Army Reserve, 
No, you could. You're a guardsman. When they form the guard, go back in the guard. And that's what I did. March of 47. What, uh, were you still down in Brooklyn? Oh, yeah. That was the beginning. Well, see, as I said earlier, um, my family had a restaurant. So uh, when we were in Australia, we lost our mess steward for some reason. He was an older man. And because I had restaurant experience, <laughs> and which I didn't want, but I became the mess sergeant of the company. Oh, I guess I was mess sergeant for nine months or something like that, until I found somebody who knew the business, because I didn't want to. But at that time, I got a promotion to a staff sergeant. When I backed the line, I got a demotion at my own request. But as a result of this, after the war, if you had served the first three grades, you were eligible to apply for commission. And that's how I became commissioned in the National Guard. And you didn't have to go through OCS or anything? You got a direct commission? Got a direct commission, but then I had to uh, qualify oh, what, they, what they call a pre-commissioned course. And then all the courses all the way. Mm -hmm. I went to a uh, basic infantry, advanced infantry, command and general staff. How long did you stay in the Guard? 42 years. Oh, wow. I retired in 1982. Now, were you ever called up for Korea or? No. Um, thank Walter Witchell for making my young wife's early days miserable. He had the 42nd Division being called. He had an article every week that we were being called up for. No, we were never called. So you stayed in the National Guard in, in the city then, in the Brooklyn area? In, in Brooklyn. Till 82. Uh, what was your rank at retirement? Uh, Brigadier General, uh, New York State List. Um, I ended up here. I'm up in this area because I ended up in the state, uh, state headquarters. I um, was a traditional guardsman except my last five years. My last five years I was full-timer at state headquarters here in Albany. Were you at the campus at that time? Yeah. In the old public security oh, building okay. before the state police took it over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they were upstairs. It was our building. They were tenants. Eventually they ended up owning the building. But that was at the time uh, we built a new one. We, the new one uh, by the airport was built just after I retired. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a story about that too. Because uh, I was a uh, logistics officer in the state USPNFO office. <clears throat> and I had about 40 people work for me. And this was in one of the other buildings on campus. But they were all going to go into this new building. So when they're planning the building, okay, yeah. Uh, Help with the planning and this and that. But nobody knew that at the time, by the time they built that building, all these people would have a PC on their desk. <laughs> because PCs didn't come in until after 82. I mean, for everybody. But uh, I had uh, <clears throat> some good commands. Now, today I dropped off a guide on. That uh, company guide on that my wife found in the attic and uh, left it upstairs from E Company at 106th. And I always said I commanded hell in the uh, 106th backwards because I had commanded L, E and H companies. <clears throat> then from there, reorganizations all the time. The 106th seemed to be the uh, outfit that always got reorganized. <clears throat> From there I went to the uh, 71st, eventually ended up commanding the battalion of the 71st. Then I commanded when they <clears throat> formed the DISCOM. Uh, 
I commanded the first discom, and it was, at that time to command the discom, there was a division support command. You had to be a, a combat arms officer to have command of the discom, which I think for myself and for anybody who later became involved, um, support, actual support and planning happened uh, for the combat arms who were involved in it. Prior to that, they, they really hadn't been involved in planning. And then from there, I went to command of the 1st Brigade. And then after the 1st Brigade, that's when I came up here. Mm -hmm. Worked in the ops office up here. Then I worked in the USPNFO office until retirement. And that's it. Okay. <laughs> How do you, uh, well, since it occupied such a large part of your life, how do you think your military time affected your life? Oh, well, see, my wife understood it. That going back to when I was a kid, the military was, as I, as I said, a big thing for me. My father was a veteran of the First War, and uh, he belonged to the Legion. He was active in the Legion. And the Legion post was in the Army. So as a kid, I spent a lot of time in the Army. So, uh, and I, in fact, in my yearbook when I graduated, it said I was going to become an Army officer. Well, it didn't happen the way I thought it would, but it happened eventually. I have uh, a son who's a retired major. I have a son who's a West Point graduate who is now a major in the Army. And I have a grandson serving in Germany who is a staff sergeant. So I think it fits into the family. Have you joined any veterans organizations? Uh, VFW, the 71st Veterans Association, American Legion. Then I belong to all of the Army United States. Well, Troy, what the heck, the Retired Officers Association just changed their name. So, yeah, I, uh, and I still get mail and, and contact. Um, and that's how I happened to come up here. Now, have you kept in contact with some that you served with? or? Well, you told me World War II? Well, that or... Yeah, well, see, getting guard. back, yeah, now World War II... Each year I go to a reunion of the 101st MP Battalion at the Niagara Falls Air Force Base. I've been going there. They've been having it there for over 25 years. That's a story in itself. But, uh, and as a result of hearing about this reunion, I, I heard about a reunion of my company. I'm the only one left in my company. 14th, uh, which used to be held in the Middle West. And here again, that's a story. We were a New York National Guard outfit. Our first draft these replacements came from the New York City area, Jersey, all around the city. Our second draft <coughs> came from the Midwest, from around Chicago, Illinois, Missouri, and that area. And apparently, a number, well, a number of them uh, brought home Australian war brides. And they got the reunion going in the Midwest. And I didn't hear about that until, I guess, maybe 15 years ago. So I used to go to that one. But two years ago was the last one. Because at that time there were four of us. Now I'm the only one left. But uh, the 101st. Now, that was a battalion, went to North Africa. When we went out, two companies, two of the original companies, they filled up. So i got to say quite a number. The last reunion, this last Labor Day, um, there were 11 of us from the original M MP battalion.
but uh, and uh, we'll, we'll have that on the first reunion as long as somebody shows up because uh, here we got another story one of the original guys um, retired a New York City fire chief but he was also in the Air Force Reserve when he retired as a fire chief he went on active duty with the Air Force in their headquarters down in uh, Georgia. And he was a uh, senior master sergeant, I think is the top enlisted rank in the Air Force. And he got to hear about this, uh, the Air Force Base, the Reserve Air Force Base of Niagara Falls. And he set up a reunion there. And he has every year since. And that's I think this was the 26th year they went there. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Yes, thank you. <laughs> You're quite welcome. <laughs> A majority of uh, the advisors that were here with the Guard, for some reason, uh, they seemed to think that this was a final get rid of assignment for uh, officers. But everyone that I met was terrific. And okay, the first, the, when I first became commissioned, Annie Lipscomb, Lieutenant Colonel, West Point graduate, he felt that way, that he was, had been sent to, as an advisor to guard, they were going to get rid of him. He was a terrific guy. And I think as, because he was so terrific and he had so much influence, on, uh, okay, he was an advisor of the 106th Infantry, but he had so much influence in the division. Um, he left us. He commanded the uh, 3rd Infantry down at uh, Arlington. Mm -hmm. And from there, he uh, commanded a, uh, oh, I think it was the 187th. Uh, when it went to, uh, he was the Brigadier General then, he, when he, they first went to Vietnam. So uh, it didn't work out the way some people seem to think. And as I say, every advisor I ever met was a fantastic man.